What's stopping you, you, you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? Why do Catholics worship Mary? What's stopping you? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? Where is purgatory in the Bible? I think the Pope has too much authority. What's stopping you? You, you, you? you are called to communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey everybody, welcome again to Call to Communion. This is the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. If that's you, you're a non-Catholic, you say, and yet you've got questions about the Catholic faith. We would love to answer some of those questions for you on this program. Here's our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're listening to us or watching us from outside North America, here's our phone number. Uh, just dial the U.S. country code and then 205 271 2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for our response. It'll be a real quick little robo answer. And then uh, just text us your first name and your brief question. Message and data rates may apply. Those of you watching us on TV right now, you can participate as well. The email address ctc at EWTN.com. Love to hear from you as well. CTC at EWTN.com. Charles Beery is our producer. Ryan Penny is our phone screener. And Jeff Burson is on social media. He'll be glad to pass on any questions you may want to pose via YouTube or Facebook live. We are streaming there right now. And he'll get those to us here in the studio. I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? You know what? I'm doing great. How about you, my friend? I'm doing well, thank you. We have a question here from John in Ohio who emailed us saying, where does the Bible tell of Peter's first visit to Rome? There is a claim out there that Peter never even went to Rome. What say you? Yeah, thanks. The Bible doesn't talk about Peter's trip to Rome. Okay. It doesn't talk about it. Uh, you know, there are, there are some who, who would like to make a case that Peter's reference to Babylon in his epistle is a veiled reference to the city of Rome because, you know, Rome is... The, uh, the image of Babylon represents in Scripture not just the geographic location of mm. Babylon, but it's kind of a symbol for, for secular uh, political authority. But, uh, but I wouldn't want to stretch that too much. So we, we really don't know that from sacred Scripture explicitly. We know it from tradition. We know it from the historical record. Okay, very good. And uh, John, thank you for your email. Here's one now from Kathy. If good works are required for us to be saved then how do we know how many good works are enough? Sure, I appreciate the question. So when, when, uh, when, this, when the Christian emerges from the baptismal font or from the confessional mm -hmm. and is uh, thereby in the state of grace, the, the love of God is infused into our hearts. So just in virtue of our transformed being, uh -huh this quality that is given to us, we are in fact loving God and loving neighbor. And anything that you do in, that is good in the state of grace merits objectively eternal life. So that's why someone like St. Dismas, the thief on the cross, he did some good works. He, did, he, he appealed to God for mercy. Mm -hmm. he, he confessed Christ. He made an act of faith and hope. Uh, he admonished us at the center, the other thief on the, on the cross. But he, it's not like he had a huge list. You know, he, he only had a few hours to get the job done, right? He did a few good things, merited eternal life. And, uh, and, and so it's not like there's a, there's a balance and you have to, you know, keep adding in good works until they somehow, you know, out, uh, outbalance your bad mm -hmm. works. It doesn't work that mm -hmm. way. It doesn't work that way. Your whole character has changed. You're reborn in Christ. You're born again. You're made into a child of God. And you have a relationship with him of love. And you just keep that going. Just keep that going, and you're saved. You're saved, right? You can derail that through through conscious moral sin, and you can deepen it through concrete acts of faith, hope, and charity that in turn merit their own specific reward. And that's why there will be levels, differentiation in heaven. Not everybody will receive the same reward in heaven. There's different degrees of charity. And, and so Christ promises rewards for specific things. He says, if you give a cup of cold water, to one of these little ones, you won't lose your reward. If you pray to your father in secret, you won't lose your reward. If you fast in secret, you won't lose your reward. If you feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give drink to the thirsty, etc., 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 you won't lose your reward. You will be rewarded for these concrete acts. But you don't have to have a some finite 
determinate number of, of concrete charitable acts in order to merit salvation. You merit salvation in virtue of the love of God that is poured into your heart through baptism. All right. And thank you so much for your email. Here's one now from Tony who says, could you please explain how the God of the Old Testament is the same God as in the New Testament? I have heard some people making the assertion that God is portrayed differently in the Old Testament versus New, uh, as in a wrathful God versus a loving God. Yeah, thanks. So I, I never understood this claim that the God of the Old Testament is somehow wrathful and the God of the New Testament is 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 all all you know mercy, love, and bunnies. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> because when I read the New Testament, I find a God of wrath and mercy. And so you know, in Luke chapter ten or Matthew chapter eleven, for instance, Christ says, "Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida!" Mm -hmm. Because if the deeds that done in you had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. But you didn't. So boy, you're going to catch it. Yeah. And in the Thessalonian correspondence, when Christ, when uh, St. Paul anticipates the second coming of Christ, part, part of the glory of the second coming is Jesus meeting out punishment on his enemies. That's the language that the apostle uses about the second coming. And uh, Christ himself speaks about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and suffering uh, uh, incomparable to anything that the world has ever seen before or since. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of fire and brimstone, if you will, in the New Testament. Uh, now, there's a promise of mercy and forgiveness as well, just like in the Old Testament. God was very serious in the Old and New Testament about obedience, about repentance from sin, about the reality of punishment if we're unrepentant, the need to get our lives straight, and the promise of mercy if we do. Same in both Testaments. All right. It's all there, right? Yeah, it's all there. Okay. Well, we thank you so much uh, for your email, Tony, and for everybody who sent us emails. If you would like to send us an email for a future show, here is the address, ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at ewtn.com. Lots of ways to uh, contact us here at Call to Communion. Uh, the one we're talking about right now is our phone number, and that's 833-288-EWTN. That's 833 288 Three nine eight six. We have several lines open right now. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000. Love to hear from you today. And again, that email address, ctc at ewtn.com. Back in just a moment with lots more here on Call to Communion. Do stay with us. It's called a communion here on EWTN. Our phone number 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Uh, David, we just received a text here just a few moments ago, and this is from uh, Maxine. Maxine checking us out on YouTube today. Maxine says, or no, that's Marjorie, I beg your pardon. It's, the screen's a little dim here. One of the main reasons I can never be Catholic is because Jacques Clement is still in discussion for canonization to sainthood. How can the Catholic Church consider a murderer for sainthood? The fact that a murderer was praised by the Pope is concerning. Um, our producer tells us uh, Jacques Clement was a Dominican lay brother who assassinated King Henry III of France. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, I appreciate the question. So um, I don't know what tradition you belong to now. Maybe you're... Um you may be nothing. Maybe you're a Protestant. So mm. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of presuming maybe you're coming from another Christian group, perhaps okay. Protestant tradition. And uh, I, someone that comes to mind who is not recognized as a saint by the Catholic Church, but is about as close to venerated as a saint as anybody within Protestantism. Right? Protestants don't have saints as such, but they right. do have people that they revere and really looked up, up to as models of Christian sure. discipleship. And I don't think anybody was more eminent in that way in the 20th century than Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, the German theologian, mm -hmm. wrote the book, The Cost of Discipleship, who, as we know, was executed uh, by Hitler for his complicity in a plot on the Fuhrer's life. Um, interestingly, uh, and I'm not an expert on the pontificate of Pius XII, but there's uh, 
some significant speculation that Pope Pius XII may have behind the scenes actively supported at least three plots on Hitler's life. Okay, I mean, he definitely wanted the guy gone, all right, <laughs> and would not have been upset if somebody had taken him out. And uh, I, I'm not, I'm not advocating a position, by the way, uh, in a moral theological position about the the prudence or the saity of assassination of tyrannical uh, foreign powers. I'm not, I'm not going there. I'm just saying that um, let, let's be careful what you're actually claiming. Mm -hmm. Let's be careful what you're claiming. And and uh, the fact that there was speculation in the 16th century about the holiness of Jacques Clement and whether or not he would be a fit subject for canonization. Look, anybody can can suggest that a cause be opened for someone's beatification or mm -hmm. canonization. You'll notice that it didn't get very far. <laughs> and to, to say that it's still in discussion is to misstate it. I, I promise you there is not a, a, a huge movement in the Vatican right now for the canonization of Jack Clement. It's just not happening, all right? The fact that someone raised it in the 16th century as a possibility doesn't mean that it is open in the sense of being an active case for sure. canonization. Mm -hmm. Um, why would someone make that suggestion? Well, can can you think of anybody of whatever religious persuasion, whether you're Catholic or Protestant or Hindu or Buddhist or whatever, alive in the world today, who would be so bold as to as to link holiness and political action in their mind, such that the guy who's who's polling for my team in the political sphere is a great guy, man, he's even a saint. You ever see that happen? <laughs> Happens all the time. Of course, of course. Now, it's not wise, it's not prudent, and and the the progress of the gospel or the progress of the kingdom of God is not linked to the, the victory of one particular political party or ideology in the public sphere, but the temptation has always existed to make that identification. All right, and so with the benefit of hindsight, we can look at a past historical epic and say, gosh, what the Catholics in this era or the Protestants in this era mm -hmm. made the mistake of, of aligning the, the interests of this political party with the interest of the church and the gospel. And that was a mistake. But it's, it's, a, ta it's a temptation that we're always subject to. Sure. And we recognize it in other people. We tend to be blind in our own case. Popes are not immune to this temptation because they're human beings. And the, the sin, uh, I believe it's a sin, of, of sort of superstitiously ideological thinking is one to which everyone, including popes, can be prone. But you'll notice that they didn't canonize the guy. That's true. They didn't canonize the guy. Okay. Marjorie, thank you so much for your text. We do appreciate that. And if you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. We're going to begin today with Christian in Grand Island, Nebraska, listening to us on our great partner there, Spirit Catholic Radio, a first-time caller. Hey, Christian, what's on your mind today? Hi, thank you so much. I just have a question about Acts 10:47. Um, it says, "Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have?" Um, how do you reconcile that passage with our Catholic belief of that um, we receive the Holy Spirit after baptism? Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. So, when you when you look to instances in the Old Testament when the Spirit would come upon kings and prophets in power, uh, it was all, like, for example, the book of Numbers, chapter 11, for example, it was always to empower the prophet or the king for some, tr for some tremendous work. Uh, very often that they might speak the word of God with boldness, all right, or proclaim God's message, or perhaps be em empowered even to go into battle, something like that. Mm. But the Spirit would always come for a very specific reason, and it is that the nature of that coming, that charismatic empowerment, was different from the promise of renewal in the heart that is the essence of the new covenant. And so when we read about that new covenant promised in the Old Testament passages like Jeremiah 29 or Ezekiel 36, we read about um, 
uh, God pouring his spirit into our hearts, circumcising the heart and writing his law on our mind so that we obey the law from an inner principle and not just from compulsion, not just from an exterior command or precept, but from an inner motive of charity. And that's the, that's the coming of the spirit that St. Paul writes about in, say, Romans chapter 2, verses 25 to 29, or Romans chapter 8, when he speaks about a man who keeps in step with the Spirit and manifests the fruits of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. These are the, these are the, this is the gift of the Spirit in baptism when we die with Christ and rise again with him. This is what Christ speaks of in John 3 when he says, unless a man is born again, he cannot in inherit the kingdom of God. It's that that inward renewal by the Holy Spirit where we're made new men and women in Christ. Now, in the book of Acts, uh, the, 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 the nature of the writing, the historical genre of writing, the, the author of Acts means to coordinate himself with the nature of Old Testament historiography. He's, he's using the same narrative style that you would find in Samuel and Kings. And it's evident that when the Spirit comes in Acts, he's, St. Luke is not talking about that interior renovation by grace necessarily. I mean, he may have that in the back of his mind, but he's demonstrating these, these charismatic empowerments for works of ministry. That's why kind of the paradigmatic sign of the Spirit's coming in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost is this speaking in foreign languages. Mm. And you'll notice that almost every time the Spirit comes in Acts, it's not to empower works of charity per se, but these, these, uh, this spirit-inspired speech, all right, whether it's speaking in tongues or prophecy or simply proclaiming the, the works of God boldly. Mm-hmm. All right? and, uh, and he's coordinating it to that Old Testament vision. So this is complementary to the Pauline image or the Jesus's teaching about that interior renovation, but not, but not in conflict with it. It's, a, it's another aspect of the Spirit's ministry, and it serves a particular narrative function mm. within the context of the book of Acts. Okay. And we thank you so much for your call, Christian. That opens up a line for you now at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833 833- 288-3986. Call to communion in progress here on EWTN. Patty's checking in with Facebook right now. Hey, Patty, glad that you're watching us today. She says, our 22-year-old son told us he is opposed to religion, any religion, because of, quote, the rules. Well, of course, he follows rules all the time, traffic rules and other rules. How can we lovingly respond to our son? That's from Patty. Right. Okay. So lovingly responding is the easy part. <laughs> right. Getting him to agree, that's the hard part. Yes. Okay. I can't tell you how to change your child's mind. Uh, I, if I knew that, I wouldn't be in the shape I'm in, right? <laughs> I mean, we all have that trouble sure. as a parent. I can give you, I can give you, uh, you know, a rational answer to the question, right? Which is, what is, what's the point of rules in religious life? Well, uh, Religion, from the point of view of the Catholic faith, is actually a virtue, right? A virtue is when is is a capacity, a power, right, to ac- exercise some faculty well for the sake of some good. Mm-hmm. What is the object of the virtue of religion? Well, it's honoring God. It's honoring God, and from one point of view, to to adequately honor God could not possibly be defined within the narrow parameter of a parameter of a list of rules. You know, as if I simply check these boxes and then I've honored God, right? Because what do we owe God? We go out everything. 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 Our life, our happiness, everything that we have that is good, we receive from God, right? What's the proper response for, for such a relationship? Well, d- gratitude, thanks, right? It's just a, a whole life given over to his service. And, and it's, it's, it's kind of analogous to saying like, how how could I adequately honor my wife for her gift of self to me? Mm-hmm. Could I could I narrowly define that within a list of rules? By no means. By no means. What a, what a what a grotesque diminution of the honor of marriage. If I could just act like just follow these rules and I've done everything I need to do for my wife, it doesn't work that way. No. Does that mean that rules don't apply? Well, you know, uh, how about how about the rule that says thou shalt not commit adultery? Is that, is that sufficient 
to define the honor that I owe my wife. By no means is that sufficient. But is it necessary? You bet. What oh, if I yeah. took the attitude of, ah, uh, you know, it isn't about rules, so I don't have to worry about the no adultery rule. Well, you see how that, what motive that would spring from, not from a desire to honor my wife. Of course. So the fact that we can lay down principles and rules in our conduct with respect to Almighty God is sensible and reasonable, but certainly not sufficient to describe the relationship of love and gratitude that should characterize our whole being. Yes, indeed. It is called a communion here on EWTN. Our phone number 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Love to hear from you today. Uh, here's a question that just came in from John. He texted us and said, God cannot be a just judge if he doesn't punish sin. If neither Christ nor the saved bear that punishment due to sin, who does? Yeah, well, first of all, I disagree with the premise of the question. I, I completely disagree that justice necessitates uh, uh, punishment, all right? Because what are, what are the purposes of punishment, okay? Well, there are at least three, right? So first of all, you punish because you want to deter uh, future crime. Sure. All right? And that's one of the reasons you might, you know, when criminals are convicted, it's public, because you want other people to know if you do this, you're going to end up like this guy, mm -hmm. okay? Um, another purpose would be curative, right? In the hopes that you could actually, uh, the fellow who's suffering the punishment might might be able to expiate his crime and have a change of heart and be better in the future, yeah. right? And another point of punishment would be retribution. Right? He's, he's incurred a debt uh, uh, to society or perhaps to a victim that he's uh, violated, and uh, he's got no way to pay that debt other than just suffering in his own person, and it's uh, and it can be expiatory in that way also. Well, you know, um, if those if those three purposes of punishment could be met in some other way, why would that be unjust? Yeah. Why would that be unjust? So first of all, uh, since God is the one that we're, that is offended by sin, all right. If God accepts in place of punishment, mm -hmm. uh, reparation. And if God restores what was taken away, namely love and gratitude to God himself, by infusing it into our hearts by grace, and simultaneously changes the offender so that he doesn't want to offend in the future, and makes a public spectacle of all of this by, by effecting it through the death of his son as a witness to his own hatred of sin, how are the ends of judicial punishment not met by the atoning death of Christ? Sure. All right. Well, we thank you so much for your question. Here's one now from Mark checking us out on Facebook today. Mark says, I have a disabled brother. Would it be okay to help support him financially while scaling back my tithing? Okay, thanks. So what the church asks of us is that we support the work of the church. That's one of the precepts of the church. Mm -hmm. We are to support the work of the church. Um, we're also to do charity, okay? Uh, the, 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 the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops recommends as kind of a guide that in their giving to support the work of the church, people might consider giving 5% of their income to their local parish, 5% to some other worthy cause. Now, that's, that's not a hard and fast law, but it's a kind of a good place to get going. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what your tithing is like right now. If you're giving 10% of your income to your parish, you're actually giving more than the bishops have asked people to consider giving. If you want to direct 5% to your disabled brother and 5% to your parish, it seems like a perfectly reasonable arrangement to me. Sure does. All right, well, thank you so much uh, for checking us out on Facebook today, Mark. We have lines open for you right now here on EWTN's Call to Communion, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Stay with us. Glad you're with us today here on EWTN's Call to Communion. Our phone number 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Here's a question now from Rick in Bay City, Michigan. He says in Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19, 
Jesus tells Peter that what he binds on earth is bound in heaven, and what is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. So what is Jesus referring to as bound and loosed? Yeah, thanks. So, so in rabbinic Judaism, binding and loosing uh, is a metaphor to describe the, the power to admit or exclude or to define something as clean or unclean. Oh, okay. And, and so it's, a, it's a, both a judicial and an executive authority. And that's what Christ gives to St. Peter. Now, I think the context, uh, you know, what are, the, what are the concerns that Peter has, uh, uh, both within Matthew and then, you know, when we can look back from the, uh, uh, after the ascension of Christ, what is he going to have to deal with? Well, one of the things that Peter is going to have to do is bear witness to the fact that Gentiles can be admitted to the household of God. And it was contested. I mean, this was the theological controversy of the first century. Can Gentiles be admitted to the church on equal footing with Jews, even though they don't keep the law of Moses? And it was Peter's testimony at the Council of Jerusalem that was determinative, that was definitive in this matter. And uh, that, that seems to make a lot of sense of the passage. I mean, St. Matthew, when he's writing his Gospels, writing after all this, and, uh, of course, you know, Christ really did give this power, but why, why does he, Matthew, render that verdict, that, that, that text, so explicit when it's not quite as clear in the other synoptics? Well, probably he's looking back to Peter's testimony at the Council of Jerusalem, and he says, you know, when, when Peter said, this is the way we're going to go, he, he meant what he said and said what he meant, and he had the authority to do it. Sure. You know, and that, that we, probably is a good way to read the gospel. Um, th- uh, in Matthew 18, two chapters later, Christ makes very clear that the same power of binding loosing can can equally be used to excommunicate. So, you know, Peter had the authority to say, Gentiles, they get in. No law of Moses, they get in. I'm the Pope, I say that. Uh, But he could also excommunicate, kick people out of the fellowship of the church. That's Matthew chapter 18. Admit, exclude, clean, unclean. Okay. And, and, uh, you know, we understand today in the office of the Pope, that the Pope has this unilateral authority to, to, uh, to rule the church. He can issue binding norms that we have to follow because he's Pope and he has this authority. And he, he does it as a service to the people of God and the church to maintain the integrity of the gospel and the purity of the people of God so we don't let any unclean thing in and we, we define away error and we define the truth and so people have the truth that they can live by and holiness as a, as a, as a motive, right? And, and we are uh, confident in the providence of God that when the church rules definitively on these things, that she's protected from error. Okay. Rick, thank you so much for your email. We do appreciate that. It is called a communion here on EWTN. Back to the phones now at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Here is John in Grand Rapids, Michigan, listening on Holy Family Radio. Hey, John, what's on your mind today? How you doing, Doctor? Hey. Love your show. Thank you. Hey, uh, you know, I've been going to ask this question for a long time. I, I tried to get through a few times, couldn't get through. But people have, have talked about est, est, extraterrestrial uh, people in the, in the universe. You know, people have seen UFOs and so on and so forth. And I had a Catholic priest one time tell me that he, he saw a UFO. He was camping. He said, I know what I saw. People don't believe me, but I know what I saw. And uh, I've heard uh, religious people say that, no, there's, no, there's no, nothing else other than the human race and so on and so on and so forth. What is your take, Doctor? Yeah, thanks. Well, first of all, we know for a fact that there are extraterrestrial intelligences, um, angels, demons, and teenagers. Right. <laughs> So they have always existed since the beginning of time. Whether or not, uh, well, I guess teenagers are embodied. Whether or not there are any extraterrestrials actually living off-planet, biological extraterrestrials and not just angelic and demonic extraterrestrials, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is an open question. I I personally, and this is just my personal opinion, I, uh, I don't think that there is any compelling evidence for the existence of of extraterrestrial biological life, don't see any evidence for that. Haven't mm-hmm. encountered any. Um, that doesn't mean that, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Sure. 
And, uh, you know, look, there's more in the ocean that we have never encountered and could not imagine uh, than, you know, than all the science fiction books in the world put together could come up with. And, uh, you know, you do a deep dive down to the bottom of the sea, you pull out some strange looking stuff. Oh, yeah. And uh, if somebody, you know, pulled a, you know, weird spiky fish out of some frozen sea on the moons of Jupiter, wouldn't bother me in the slightest. There's nothing in my Catholic faith that says that you can't pull strange spiky fish out of the bottom of the sea in Jupiter, right? Um, now, I, I do think that the incarnation of the Son of God, the incarnation, the assumption of a human nature by the second person of the Trinity, privileges the human race in all the universe in a unique way. That's obvious. God becomes incarnate eternally in a human nature. That's unique. He didn't become incarnate in the spiky fish on the moon of Jupiter. Yeah. But he didn't become incarnate in a canine either, you know, or an elephant. I mean, those are animals. They're biological creatures. They're delightful, but they're not, they don't share the hypostatic union with the second person of the Trinity. So if we find biological life uh, outside our solar system or someplace else, uh, that'd be neat. You know, I'll be the first guy reading the Scientific American article on the thing. Um, but they don't share with us the dignity of being hypostatically united to the Son of God. All right. And, John, thank you so much for your call. It is called a communion here on EWTN. Let's go to Oscar in Santa Clarita, California, a beautiful city, uh, checking us out today on YouTube, a first-time caller. Oscar, what's on your mind today? Hey, thank you for taking my call. Uh, I just had a question on um, kind of determining the difference between venial sin and mortal sin. Now, I know there's conditions for mortal sin, but it seems I get confused because it seems like those conditions could also apply to venial sins, and then it becomes a mortal sin. So I, I'm a bit confused on that. If you can yeah, sure. I appreciate it. So the conditions for a mortal sin cannot be applied to a venial sin. That's why they're venial. All right. So the first condition for a mortal sin is that it must be something objectively grave. Okay. And and so some sins are are gr more grave than others. All sure. right. Uh, let me see if I can give you an instance. If you were to go into a court and swear on the Bible that, uh, that, that you saw Tom Price pull the trigger, right, and you, you bore false testimony against my friend Tom Price and put him away in prison, on the strength of your testimony, they convicted him and hauled him off when he was, in fact, innocent. And you knew he was innocent, but you just had it out for him. The consequences of that act would be very grave, extremely grave. So that's not a little white lie. That is that is a that's bearing false witness in a very solemn way, and the consequences would be the destruction of a man's life. Compare that to answering falsely when your great aunt asks you if you like her hat covered in cherries. <laughs> right? I mean, yes. uh, you know there. They're both not true. All there right. is a spectrum here. Okay. But the consequences and the severity of the thing, very, very different. Sure. All right. Uh, you know, another example. Um, you know, you, 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 you snatch a candy bar from the checkout aisle at the grocery store versus uh, you're, a, you're a charlatan who sells, you know, fake insurance policies and investments to little old ladies and, uh, and steal all their future income so that they die destitute. Mm. Enormous difference. It's theft in each case, but the consequences are enormously different. And you can go through each of the types of sin that a man might commit, and you can differentiate very grave case from, you know, rather trivial in terms of the amount of harm that's done. Mm -hmm. So some sins are more grave than others. Um, uh, that's condition number one. The second condition is that uh, we can't, we have to commit a mortal sin freely. freely. This has to be our own motive. It has to be our own action, not not compelled or under any kind of delusion about mm -hmm. the thing. Um, and uh, and again, there you know somebody could could force me against my will into a situation in which I would seem to be complicit in an act that I myself did not personally intend. And that's you know obviously the intent is is critical for the commission of a morally relevant fault. I mean. Mm -hmm. Um, example, uh, let's say I'm a construction worker and I'm on top of a building 
and uh, and I you know and I toss a cinder block off the roof of the building because I think I've got clear you know area down below and lo and behold Tom's my whipping board today Tom comes around the corner and gets hit on the head with a cinder block and it kills him but I didn't intend to kill him and I thought I was in the clear and I thought I throw the cinder block off well my lack of intent means that that might be manslaughter or wrongful death but it's certainly not intentional murder sure versus I'm leaning over the edge and taking careful aim <laughs> yeah right so the intent matters all right and uh, and then also knowing that it's wrong I need to know I need to genuinely understand that it's wrong and 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 have that capacity to form that moral judgment um, I, another example um, murder is wrong it's always wrong it's always wrong it's terrible to take a life but it would we consider it the same to to kill a man in cold blood in the modern world with the benefit of our civil justice system and laws uh, compared to say maybe somebody who lived in a very very primitive society where the only form of justice available was the vendetta system and and in many times and places in history that has been the only form of justice available well if that's all you've got are there likely to be transgressions against justice in the ex in the execution of vengeance? Of course there are. But the ability of the one perpetrating that crime to kind of differentiate between personal vengeance and the form of justice known as vendetta would be pretty hard to slice. And I think we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't approve the action, and we would try to bring that culture and that society into a more rational conception mm -hmm. of jurisprudence but we also would not judge that person as harshly as we would judge somebody committing just a cold-blooded murder today. So there are things that can differentiate all of these categories. Now, I think more to the point, can we have certainty in the moment that I've just crossed the line between venial and mortal? Probably not. Probably not. Okay. Um, uh, and, and also if, it's a, and also if, if there's a borderline case... The safe thing is to confess the sin as if it were mortal. Uh, you know, alternately, if you're someone who's given to scrupulosity and you're just terrified that everything that you do is mortal, then what we've got to deal with that is a psychological problem, right. not as a moral one, right? Uh, but there really are differences between sins. And in sacred scripture, in James chapter 3, the apostle differentiates the gravity of sin. And he says, well, we all stumble in many ways venial sin. Mm -hmm. But the man who can control his tongue, he's a perfect man. All right? So he, St. James envisions a, a disciple of Christ who is seeking to live a holy life, but he's, he's stumbling in many ways. And he's, he's, he, he's not watching his tongue. He's saying unkind things. But James doesn't imagine that that would disqualify someone for eternal life. By contrast, St. Paul enumerates several things that will cut off the flow of grace into our soul and keep us out of heaven. He says fornication, adultery, factions, drunkenness, carousing, hatred, uh, disobedience to parents. He says these kinds of things, if you do these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Mortal sense. Okay. Oscar, thank you so much for your call. We do appreciate that. Call to Communion here on EWTN. I want to tell you about a brand new book now available from EWTN Publishing. We have it right here on the desk with us today. It is called Raising Upright Kids in an Upside-Down World by our friend Dr. Ray Garendi. Dr. Ray addresses some of the hardest questions of modern parenting, parenting in the year 2020. Things like, uh, how do you manage your children's access to pop culture? Dr. Ray's got some very clear ideas about that. How do you handle the overabundance of stuff that engulfs your family's everyday life? We all have things that we could probably do without. So do check out this wonderful book. It's available right now from EWTNRC.com. It's called Raising Upright Kids in an Upside-Down World. Buy Catholic, shop EWTNRC.com. It's a great book. Let's go now to uh, Katie in Athens, Georgia, listening on the EWTN app, a free download. Hey there, Katie, what's on your mind today? Hi, Tom. Hi, Dr. Anders. Uh, thank you for this show. I very much depend on it. Thank you. Um, I just had a question. Hopefully it's a quick one. Um, I have a family member that's um, 
Protestant and then also a family member, not a family member, I'm sorry, a friend that's Jehovah's Witness. And both have expressed concern that Catholics don't pray specifically in Jesus' name. And although I've mentioned we do the Holy Trinity, which Jesus obviously is part of, they still think that's a big problem. So I guess I don't understand the concern, and maybe if you could just touch on that a little bit, I'd appreciate it. Um, first of all, I don't think the accusation is true. Tom, you and I pray every day before we go on the air today. Every day. Do you remember what I said today before we got I on believe the air? you use those exact words in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Absolutely. I pray in Jesus' name. So, this, first of all, the accusation is just false. You yeah. do pray in Jesus' name. Um, it is appropriate to pray in the name of the Blessed Trinity. And in fact, Christ gives us this invocation in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in, uh, in, um, uh, in Matthew chapter 28. And, and of course, it also comes down to us through sacred tradition as well. We know that the sign of the cross, which is done in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is of apostolic origin and is attested even in the second century church fathers. So it's appropriate to do it. Um, I, I'm, I'm puzzled by the suggestion that this, this somehow some kind of magical or formulaic significance, mm -hmm. and that if I invoke Christ, God the Father and the Holy Spirit, that that somehow doesn't work unless I use a specific formula? Uh, you know, I mean, that, that, that seems odd to me because the nature of the Christian's relationship to God is sonship filiation, mm -hmm. love, gratitude, and obedience. And, and I, it's impossible for me to imagine a, a loving father who would say, well, you know, you, you didn't use the proper form of address, therefore I'm not going to answer your prayer. I mean, it, the point of invoking the name of Christ is not for the benefit of God. I mean, he knows. It's, it's so that we call to mind that our prayers are effective or not simply through the mediation of Christ who gave his life for us. But doesn't the invocation of the Blessed Trinity accomplish that? I mean, doesn't that, doesn't that let us know that our dependence is on God and the atoning work of Christ? Isn't that the point of the invocation? N not, not simply to, as if we had some sort of technical protocol and we were going to get thrown out of the throne room if we didn't use the right verbiage. That would, that would seem to make God into a kind of uh, oriental despot or tyrant yeah. rather than a loving father. Yeah. Katie, thank you so much for your call. Let's go now to uh, Amy in Farmington Hills, Michigan, checking us out today on Sirius XM 130. Amy, what's on your mind today? Hi, um, I have a, a, a quick question. Um, I'm going this Sunday to a Greek Orthodox um, service. I'm going to 8 o'clock Mass with my family and my friend who's kind of fallen away from the church. I want her to go back to her Greek Orthodox so she can receive Eucharist. So I'm going to go with her. My three-part question is, number one, am I committing a sin by going to uh, a Greek Orthodox service? Number two, um, am I allowed to receive communion? Or since I go to the 8 o'clock one, don't do it. I don't know. Is that is another sin? And number three, she said, consecration um, can only occur once a day in the Orthodox Church. So how do I answer that? Because uh, I know as Catholics, we bust out five or six of those um, in weekend Masses. Sure. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the question. Um, you are not sinning. You're not sinning by taking your friend to her Orthodox liturgy. And it is, it's entirely appropriate that your Orthodox friend should attend the Divine Liturgy. And she's not Catholic. She does not recognize the universal jurisdiction of the Pope. Uh, and so she's not in communion with the Holy Father. Mm -hmm. She's not Catholic. Uh, but the Orthodox have a valid liturgy, and they have a valid apostolic succession. And she validly receives the body and blood of Christ in that liturgy and, and, and hopefully uh, will be brought to holiness thereby. And we look forward to seeing her in heaven. All right? And in the meanwhile, we pray for the full reunion of Christ's church and that the East and West can get back on the same page again. So you're not doing wrong to help her do good. And that's appropriate for her because given her state of formation and her background and culture, that's, that's how she understands Christ and the gospel. And, and you know, there's some deficiencies there, mm -hmm. but we're going to leave that up to God to fix. Um, however, you cannot receive Holy Communion in that church. You cannot for two reasons. One, we won't let you. 
and two, they won't let you. <laughs> All right. The Orthodox do not admit Catholics to their communion, and the Catholic Church does not permit her faithful to receive communion in an Orthodox Church, except in a kind of case of urgency. So, you know, if you were sojourning in Greece, and there wasn't a Catholic priest for miles, and, you know, you got hit by an errant motorcycle, and, and you were getting ready to expire, you could request uh, last rites from an Orthodox priest, and they would be valid, and you could licitly receive them. Okay. Because you wouldn't have access to a Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. uh, but it would not be appropriate for you to receive communion this Sunday, and it does not fulfill your Sunday obligation as a Catholic. Um, and the fact that the Orthodox have a, have a canon prohibiting multiple consecrations in a day is of no consequence or moment for a Catholic because we're not Orthodox. All right. And the Church permits, as you recognize, multiple Masses to be said not only in a day but in a week. And, uh, you know, and the more the merrier, right? So that's, we're not bound by Orthodox canon law. We're bound by the law of the Church. And, uh, and, uh, and the Pope and the bishops have that authority given to them by Christ to determine the times and places and the manner of the celebration of the Sacred Eucharist. And so, uh, you know, you can go to 8 o'clock, you can go to 6 o'clock, you can go to 5.30 the night before, and you can go again on Monday. And isn't that good? I love the term she used, busting out four or five times a day. <laughs> I just thought that was great. Amy, thank you so much for your call. We have time for one or two more. Let's go to Caitlin in Seattle listening on the EWTN app. Caitlin, what's on your mind today? Hi, thank you for taking my call. Um, so I have a question. Um, if your child directly asks you about a past sin that you may have committed, um, how do you address it without lying if you don't necessarily want them to know about it? And um, I just know from my own experience when I was a teenager, my mother was very honest with me about her past sins, and it made me feel like it was okay to go ahead and do that. So I just want to see how to go about it. Well, I think you have already articulated the motive for not uh, revealing these things. Mm -hmm. Because in your own experience, when you learned that your parents, you know, had feet of clay, rather than humanizing your parents, what it did was uh, seem to give those sins a pass. You said, well, mom turned out okay or seems to have, uh, so I guess I can do this too. Uh, this is just my personal judgment. You can come to a different judgment. My personal judgment based on my experience as a parent uh, is uh, I would I would say to my child, look, my past is forgiven by Christ. He doesn't remember it. Why should I? We don't need to go there. Good answer. Caitlin, thank you so much for your call. Here is Michelle now in San Antonio, listening on Guadalupe Radio, a great partner there. Hey, Michelle, what's on your mind today? Yes, hello. My husband is coming around. He's Baptist and I'm Catholic. He's coming around to being Catholic, and he believes in the Eucharist, the transformation of the communion into the body and blood of Jesus and things like that. But he says one thing that is, bothers him is that he doesn't need the intercession of the Pope to communicate with Jesus. But I don't know what to say to that. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate the question. He misunderstands the office of the papacy. We don't have a Pope so that he can intercede for us with God. That's not the principal per ministry of the Pope. The, per the principal ministry of the Pope is one of jurisdiction. He has a, an executive and juridical authority over the household of God. So, uh, you know, I don't, need, I don't need the president of uh, the country to intercede with God for me. But I do need a president or a prime minister or a king or a monarch or somebody mm -hmm. to be an executive authority to direct the government. Otherwise, the whole thing just descends into chaos. Mm -hmm. The Pope's principal ministry is one of jurisdiction and teaching, not intercession. Now, every priest, every priest, not just the Pope, but every priest in the Catholic Church has a special intercessory ministry where they, uh, well, I should say a ministry of mediation, where they administer God's forgiveness and grace to me, and in turn effect the sacrifice of the Mass on my behalf before Christ. That's not unique. The Pope does that, but so does every single solitary priest in the Catholic Church. That's not what distinguishes the Pope. We need the Pope because we need an executive authority to administer the household of God so that we can be in unity. Absolutely. All right, uh, Michelle, thank you so much for your call. We could not get to but a great question. 
in San Antonio, Texas, uh, who had a great question. Or, yeah, just, just couldn't get to it. Uh, we do the best we can. We've got uh, 55 minutes here to try to get everybody taken care of. Dr. David Anders, thank you, sir. Thanks, Tom. We do our radio program Monday through Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern right here on EWTN Radio with an encore at 11 p.m. Eastern and a best of show on Sundays at 2 p.m. Eastern. On behalf of our fabulous team here, Charles Beery, Ryan Pen Penny, and Jeff Burson, I'm Tom Price, along with Dr. David Anders. Thanks for joining us today here on EWTN's Call to Communion. We will see you next time. God bless.